the half of the university. I would like to welcome all of our students, faculty, staff, and community visitors to the 2019 uh, Windows of the World Symposium. Uh, this is an annual event that we have every year to celebrate international culture and diversity and to bring different speakers to the symposium to talk about uh, various types of topics that I know are of interest to you but may not be covered in any of your particular classes. So this is a very uh, interesting and fun event. Uh, tomorrow uh, will be the Windows on the World uh, event for all of the different foods and culture that will be over in Cooper Evelyn. And I hope all of you can uh, go through that as well. So welcome and I hope you enjoy this morning's speaker. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lefurio to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Okay, and as Mark said, this is the 2019 symposium, so we've got a really vibrant topic today. And a wonderful speaker, uh, Dr. Mike Gunter Jr. is a professor of political science at Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. He is also the director of the International Affairs Program at the Holt School there, and co-director of the Australian Studies Program. He has received many honors, including being a Fulbright Scholar in the Slovak Republic, a recipient of the Sidney Ulmer Fellowship, and he holds a PhD in political science from the University of Kentucky, a BA in political science with honors from Vanderbilt University, and he is a Cookville High School alumnus. Uh, Dr. Gunter is author of several books, including Tales of an Eco-Tourist and Building the Next Ark. In his talk, he's gonna take us to a number of the world's most amazing locales, a mix of domestic and overseas hotspots under threat from climate change, in the tradition of Mark Twain and Rick Steves, he offers a passionate plea for the power of travel to spark both local adaptation and global mitigation. And so without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Mike Gunter, Jr. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here on a Friday morning. Um, I want to an extend special thanks to uh, Dr. Nat and, and Dr. Maxwell. And um, extra special thanks to uh, Kate Kumar for starting WOW um, years ago. Um, and it's an honor to, to be here and uh, come back and, and see how much uh, Cook Full and Tennis has kept you um, I wanted to uh, uh, start off uh, with just a couple slides here to, to set the stage and then dive into um, some places that uh, I've had the, the um, special privilege to go to. Uh, a lot of this is, is based on um, an interview I had a chance to do with uh, about a month and a half ago with the USA Today. They're actually going to uh, run the, the piece a week from today um, and sort of lead up to, to Earth Day. Thank you. Uh, but uh, the, the context of all this, if you might have heard, uh, the planet's getting a little warmer. And in fact, uh, this is an interesting study that just came out a couple weeks back. Um, if you think of us as, what are we, about 78 miles from Nashville? Um, by 2080, the expectation is that uh, summers um, in Nashville will look more like summers in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, it'll be about 3.3 Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit warmer, and about 56% wetter. I'd be happy to go into more detail about um, climate change uh, at the end of the presentation, but I wanted to just touch on it here for a couple minutes and then jump into uh, some of the locales that are being affected. Um, data that we have um, with modern temperature gathering equipment goes back to about 1895 in the United States, uh, about 1885 globally. Uh, we were a little bit behind back then. Uh, what that data shows us is that the five hottest uh, years on record um, are the last five. Uh, admittedly, that's only a little over 100 years, and we'd like to do more. And scientists, climate scientists, in particular a uh, climate scientist out of Penn State, 
that shared a Nobel um, Peace Prize with uh, about a dozen plus other folks, um, designed this graph uh, a few years back now. Can you s tell what's going on with that graph? Feel free to, I've got some slides where I'm going to push people to jump in more, but on this graph, this is a graph that you may have seen. Has anyone seen it before? It's called the hockey stick graph. And what you see here is basically a thousand years worth of data. And over that thousand years, what do you see? Increasing. Increasing. Although for about 900 years, what do you see? You see a lot of movement, right? Climate changes. Climate changes quite a bit. So you see a lot of movement, but on average, what do you see for 900 years? Fairly stable. You see things like the Little Ice Age. My clicker's not showing very well, but you see the Little Ice Age. And then right around 1900, you see the increase. Although if you look to the left, and you see our vertical axis is measuring temperature in Celsius, it's not what at least myself as a non-scientist, we have some scientists in the room, but you claim to be a scientist, studying science. Well, how, okay, then everybody else is a non-scientist. What, what do you agree with me on in terms of, of this Massive increase. Oh, Friday morning crowd. <laughs> Everybody's looking forward to John Pelfrey coming in later this afternoon. Any basketball coach? Um, well, I don't think negative 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 sounds like very much. Do you? We had a scientist. The scientist would say actually that is significant. And in fact, look at what it shows with the Little Ice Age. It was less than that, really. But it was a major impact, not just on Europe, but the globe. So this is called the hockey stick graph. The last uh, 100 plus years has been a, a dramatic um, increase. Remember I said uh, modern temperature gather um, temperature gathering equipment only goes back a little over 100 years. So this is done differently. This is done um, with proxy. This is done with tree core samples, ice core samples, things like that. But again, I can get into that later if people have, have more questions. And again, this is uh, what, what we've been told is the sort of the tipping point, the point from which there's no return, according to the climate scientists, is two degrees Celsius. Since we're Americans, we can inflate that a little bit. We can change to Fahrenheit, and what we're talking about is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember what I just said about Nashville in 2080? Um, it's right around this. All right. Maybe the pretty pictures will get things going here. Uh, so I, uh, I'm not going to have the uh, whole top 10 list that comes out next week. Um, there's only seven I'm talking about, and there's, there, some of them overlap, some of them don't. But uh, we might as well start for a reach. Um, in terms of places that I would encourage you to think about going, um, this one's definitely a reach. Um, but I had a, ch a chance to go here. Um, it's difficult to get to Antarctica. Uh, it's a lot easier than it was than in the, the golden age of exploration uh, when people like Ernest Shackleton were going there. But it's still hard, especially for a land lover like me, because you have to cross the Drake Passage, literally the, the roughest waters in the world, unless you uh, happen to know somebody in government who can fly over there. You gotta go by boat, and that is not fun, I can tell you that. <laughs> the entire boat was practically sick. Um, but about two days to get from the tip of Argentina, um, Ushuaia, Argentina, to the Antarctic Peninsula to swim. All right, I cheated a little bit. There's volcanic activity, um, and where I'm standing, of course the air is awfully cold. Where I'm, where I'm standing, it's, it's like a sauna, but we had a defilibrator on hand because where we dive in and behind that, it's about one degree Celsius, one, two degrees Celsius, so it's pretty cold. That wasn't the real reason to go there, of course. Uh, the real reason to go there was to look at the impacts of, of uh, man uh, 
on the Antarctica. Um, it's been said that Antarctica is like a, a frozen Las Vegas. Uh, what happens in Antarctica stays in Antarctica. And that's because uh, Antarctica is not only the, the coldest continent and the windiest continent and the highest continent, but it's also the driest continent. And so what you're seeing here is a, uh, a whaling boat from about the uh, 19th century. And you can see it hasn't decomposed very much. That has to do with um, the lack of humidity, the dryness of the continent. So I was there looking at um, the impacts that we have had over the years on Antarctica and the impacts of climate change. And this is, uh, this is a um, Chilean uh, research station that uh, was looking specifically at differences in penguins. All right, here's an easy question. Well, maybe not too easy for those in back. Um, this is a Gen 2 penguin. Can you see what he has in his mouth? Very good. So what these penguins do is they go to the rocks, and then they come down to the shoreline, and they build a pebble nest. And uh, when there's a lot of snow on the ground, uh, that can be difficult. Literally, these pebble nests are right on top of each other. And they, these penguins are very friendly creatures. If you've seen any of those Madagascar cartoon movies, right? Uh, but they, uh, they need space. And um, as temperatures are getting warmer, what do you think is happening with their real estate there on the, the shores of the peninsula? Careful, might be a trick question. There's something that's shrinking for the next penguins, the Adela, their cousins. But as it's getting warmer and the snow melts, the Gen 2 penguins have more space. They're what we would call climate change benefactors. Right? They are benefiting from climate change. And what these scientists have found is huge increase in Gen 2 population. Now, who's to say that? You know, there's probably a, a tipping point there too. But for the moment, these guys are doing well. And then if I told you that the way these guys survive is that they uh, require sea ice to reach and then fish from. They can't just fish from, from land. Um, with warming temperatures, back to your, your suggestion, what do you think is happening with the deli penguins? They're, the, the habitat they require is shrinking. Right? So here, just in a tip of Antarctica, just one um, uh, comparison of two subspecies of penguin we can see some very different things happen. All right, coming back to our our country. Anybody have a guess where this is? Give you a clue. Glacier National Park. Anybody heard what's going on in Glacier National Park? <coughs> 1850, they had 150 glaciers in Glacier National Park. That helps explain the name. Talking right up there at the northern border of Montana. Actually, um, since 1932, it's been partnered with the Canadian uh, National Park, sort of uh, first of first of its kind there. So we have a cross-border two parks, Waterton National Park. Well, I think we're down to 24 glaciers in Glacier National Park today, and certainly by the end of the century, the way things look, there won't be any. Uh, probably considerably sooner. So I would encourage you, if you ever get the opportunity, go out to Montana, check out this park. It's a gorgeous park. And literally, its namesake is disappearing in your generation. Here's an example of that work. All right. Surely somebody knows what this place is. Jumping back outside the United States. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, but you know which clause this would be? I heard something. Yes. This is um, um, 
Piazza de San Marco, uh, or St. Mark's, in the angle-sized version. This is actually 12 years ago. This is when it was then my little girl, turned 17 tomorrow, but still four in my eyes like this, <laughs> this picture. Um, this is in August of 2007 in the morning. That's not her, that's a different girl. August 2007 in the afternoon. The UC San Diego, the Scripps Institute, which is studying climate change all around the world, they've um, been documenting this for several decades now. Actually, I think it's almost approaching half a century. They're seeing about a tenth of an inch um, increase. Um, annually in Venice. Uh, this is a problem. If you have real estate in Venice, or if you want to go visit Venice before it's gone, coming closer to home. Anybody been down to Florida? Right. Get a chance to go to the oldest European settlement in the United States. St. Augustine. It's on the coast. It's kind of in the Jacksonville area almost. Um, this is what the line of bridges looks like on a typical day. It's actually one of the uh, recommended by National Geographic and Rachel Ray as one of the top ten places to go see holiday lights. Massive um, Christmas display. Um, this is what that same street next to the uh, Bridge of Lions, I think I got a picture there, is the Bridge of Lions, um, looked like in October 2016 with Hurricane Matthew. One of the things that climate change brings to us is it, it's increased evaporation, um, warming of ocean waters, and not more hurricanes, actually probably a little bit less hurricanes, but when they do come, a lot more strong, a lot stronger. And so in Florida where I live, um, no place is, is safe, including the Orlando area in the center. Um, but particularly on the coast, this is an issue. And um, as the oldest uh, European settlement in the United States, this is a pretty significant historical fact. And I encourage you to go there, the sea walls that you see here um, have, um, I think the last major expansion was sort of in the 1970s, 1980s. So here you can see three of characters that I know um, and sort of a, an update just down the, uh, just down river, this is the Mentanzas River, from the uh, Castillo de San Marco, the, the famous Spanish um, castle there. But, it doesn't take, this is the really crazy thing, it doesn't take a Hurricane Matthew to create problems in St. Augustine. <coughs> it can happen on a sunny day. Um, this is what they used to call nuisance flooding, a sunny day flooding. Um, this is because of the sea level rise that we're experiencing um, all along coastlines around the world. But particularly an issue for where I live in Florida, uh, in Florida, uh, maybe it's going to be changing now since the, uh, the election last, um, last November, but previously we had a governor, um, Governor Rick Scott, who didn't allow our Department of Environmental Protection to use the words climate change and global warming. Um, it was never a formal edict. Um, it was that charge was given orally, uh, but for about a four or five year stint there, we can't use these terms. So when I went and I interviewed the mayor of St. Augustine and the um, city manager of St. Augustine, they were um, very insistent that uh, I couldn't quote them using that, that term, even though we were using it a lot, um, that we had to just use the words sea level rise, because that's, that's not as a uh, politically polarizing, um, if you will, as, as the word climate change. But what's going on here is uh, during king tides, during the highest tides of the month, uh, water is basically coming in through the outtake um, drains that we have built to drain out rainwater. And so instead of that water going out, 
like we originally designed it 100 years ago, or St. Augustine's case, even longer, uh, it's coming up from the ocean. And uh, this is a problem in a lot of places, including, yeah, uh, and particularly this, this is uh, Miami Beach. But Miami is, is in serious threat uh, from this as well. Again, doesn't take a storm, doesn't take a hurricane, doesn't just take um, a rainy event. Could be sunny day flooding. Um, and what um, Miami Beach has done is they spent, I think they had planned for 500 million, but I think it's up to 600 million dollars on a pumping system to pump out this water, raise street levels, um, and that will get them through about 2050. All that work. So they bought themselves a little bit of time, but 2050, I mean, you guys will be around, I probably won't be around to see that, but you guys will be around to see that. Uh, what's Miami Beach going to do after 2050? For that matter, what is all Miami going to do? Or all of South Florida going to do? Take anything away from this talk this morning? I would say don't invest in South Florida property. Um, but people still are. This is what 2 degrees Celsius <coughs> rise in temperatures would look like at the end of this century in terms of South Florida. Now, for me, right here in the center, this could be good stuff. That besides having to deal with a couple extra hurricanes and strength of those hurricanes, I am now ocean <coughs> property. Real estate values go up. So maybe I'm the uh, Gen 2 penguin instead of the, uh, the Adelis down there in South Florida. Um, Climate change um, affects everyone, and that's part of the problem that we've been struggling with and how to deal with it. Because um, if the United States is going to deal with it, or China better sure as hell will deal with it, Europe and Japan, and, and all the developed states that have pretty much put us in this position in the first place. Um, but it does impact people differently, depending on where you live. All right. So, sticking with Florida just briefly before jumping um, again outside the United States, as you see, South Florida is in trouble. And that includes the Keys and uh, famous Keys like um, John uh, Pennycamp from Coral Reef State Park. But where we've seen a lot of attention is in the largest um, coral reefs in the world, the Great Barrier Reef out in Australia. And in particular, the Great Barrier Reef is about 3,000 different coral reefs. You can see how massive it is. Um, equivalent, um, same areas, these four countries. It is so big, you can literally see it from space. Has anybody heard what's going on with the coral reefs there in, in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef? The corals are dying. The corals are dying. Yes. So they are bleaching. This is um, this is some pictures of of when the reef looks good, but this is when the coral bleaching takes place. And again, kind of hard to wrap your mind around it from a non-scientist perspective because this is basically about a degree change in. Um, temperature, degrees Celsius of change in the water temperature doing this. And it, it, you know, it, again, if you ever get stuck on an essay answer in a social science course, you can start with the Industrial Revolution or it depends. Um, this, what you have to get to this point depends on a lot of things. There's about, um, about 500 different types of coral. It's got hard coral, soft coral. The, the, their ability to be resilient, to withstand um, temperature varies depending on the type of species we're talking about. Um, also it depends on um, how quickly the water returns to its previous temperature. Oops, sorry. Uh, 
And then finally, it depends on what's going on on land nearby, right? Is there a lot of agriculture that's taking place? Is there runoff? Are there other complications? So there are a lot of variables here. But in general, what we're seeing is coral reefs across the globe struggling from Florida to the Great Barrier Reef. And the Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest, so large, where we can see it from space, that it is the most resilient of all of these, um, it is struggling severely. And in fact, if you just break it into three sectors, you can see that the southern sector is doing okay. But as you move northward, increasing difficulties. So the Great Barrier Reef is more equipped to handle climate change than many other reefs. But if something so big that you can see it from space is struggling, I think obviously when you start to, to scale down the places like the Keys, you can see the problems that we're dealing with are, are serious. All right. Anybody have a guess as to where this is? What's that? In some of their literature, they promote this as the first place in the continental United States to see sunrise. Not sure that's exactly correct. This is Count. Uh, this is uh, Cadillac Mountain and Mount Desert Island. Um, this is a famous shot that maybe you'll see in some coffee table type books. This is um, Bass Harbor Lighthouse. Um, this is Maine. And um, Maine is a, uh, the, this is the last example I wanted to, to give you. Place, last place I wanted to encourage you to, to visit um, before taking questions. Um, Maine's an interesting case. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Maine? Oh, by the way, we're talking about right in here. That's Mount Desert Island. Um, I agree. Lobster. <laughs> um, pretty pricey down here. Um, not, not as pricey up there. Here's the little story I want to tell you about um, lobster in Maine. All right, so they have lots of fun things there. Uh, again, pointing to National Geographic. Um, National Geographic says that um, Bar Harbor, right there on Mount Desert Island, is one of the top ten places to go um, have a Fourth of July experience. They do all kinds of crazy things like lobster races. This is my middle child. Here he's getting to pick out the lobster that we were going to bet on, and, and then they race them. And then, of course, um, you can't go there without enjoying this uh, this uh, incredible meal. Um, but uh, here's what's been going on with the American lobster, the, sci the scientific um, species that we're dealing with here. Just over the last, when did that start, 1967? So over the last uh, half century, New York has lost about 97.7% of its uh, lobster um, productivity uh, in even a shorter period than what we're seeing. Um, and Maine has benefited. About 82% of lobster today in the United States comes out of Maine. So what's happening here? Um, basically, the lobsters are migrating north, northeast, and actually out to deeper water, too at the rate of about 43 miles a decade. And so the entire southern New England lobster industry has crashed. It's not viable at all anymore. On the other hand, in May, <coughs> they've enjoyed a tremendous boom. You can see that depicted here in the track. In fact, uh, I was reading just last week uh, they are having trouble holding people in high school because it's so lucrative a business. Um, it's possible to bring in about five, five and a half thousand dollars a day in lobster in May. However, the lobster, the American lobster, is migrating 43 miles 
a decade northeast. So the ability to go to this famous, this is the last place I encourage you to go, the Trenton Bridge Lobster Pound. Here you can see them putting together the lobsters. Um, that American lobster, in about 30 to 40 years, is it going to be American anymore? <laughs> you're going to have to go to Canada to get your lobster, if you're American lobster. So, um, I would encourage you <laughs> to um, go before these places are forever changed. And I'll stop there and, uh, and take questions. Yes. It seems like it's getting better the more north. So uh, the further and latitude from the equator that you go south of the equator and north of the equator, the, um, the effects of climate change are exacerbated at the poles. And so you see things like uh, Alaska um, over the last 50, 60 years, I think it's 60, has warmed 6 degrees Fahrenheit. And this July, I'm going to go up there and do some interviews with uh, climate scientists. Um, there's some, maybe you've seen, some of you have maybe seen this online, you heard about drunken trees. Trees that have grown in the tundra, in the permafrost, and as that melts, then they, they look like they had a, a, a long weekend and are tilted. They're not dead, they will eventually uh, die, but they're, they're still alive and they're just growing sideways now. Uh, because the, the structure, the, the permafrost that they're rooted in has is, is, is melted away. It's concerned for a lot of things, including the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, that 800-mile pipeline that brings black gold to us all. Good question. Other questions? Yes? How would you uh, bring current international policy? Right now. How would I rate them? Yeah. Um, good question. Uh, I think that we struggled mightily for really a quarter century, 25 years. Uh, in late 2015, we had the Paris Accord that um, wasn't perfect. Uh, in particular, it, it used um, you, you used a lot. It relied heavily on sort of on, on countries to to pressure one another um, without formal um, without formal commitments. Uh, and and so it, it had it, it wasn't a perfect treaty, but it was darn well a lot better than anything we've had before. And so I think that shows some progress. I think the, the messiness of, of working through 193 countries in the United Nations is a problem. And really, if you look at the, the breakdown in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it's got to be us and China. So China passed this in late 2006 as the largest annual emitter in greenhouse gases. That's so true. Anything that to be effective has to involve China. But we're still number one, in case you're worried, um, we're still number one in historical emissions. So I would argue that anything that happens has to happen um, with both China and the United States on board. And we did see some progress there in late 2014, uh, some commitments. Uh, the politicians love to, to, uh, to date those well in the future. So the 2014 commitments by the United States and China had to do with in the US part um, uh, commitments by 2025 and China part commitments by 2030. Uh, but they were significant and I think we if we could continue along those sorts of lines, um, we we have that's a promise. That's a promising life. Now the question remains, will we do so in time? And are we are we just still acting too slowly? Other questions? Yes? What role do you see the, the developing world with nations like India who have a rising middle class and uh, expanding access to things like uh, air conditioning and cars uh, and, and refrigeration? So as their demand increases, how does that play into our solution? <coughs> um, 
that's that's the, the probably the a bigger problem in my mind than China. Um, I think China, in part because it, at least for now, they're an authoritarian society, and when the government decides they want to take action, and the government has decided uh, because they felt basically there's a there's a well-known academic thing in the Elizabeth economy, she said China is losing about 10% of its GDP annually because of environmental pollution. And over the last decade, China, which once was building a new coal-fired power plant about every five to seven days, they have invested heavily in solar. Um, they've supplanted the United States, which was a leader of this in the 1970s, and Germany, which was a leader of this in the 1980s. Um, they have um, recognized where the future lies. Um, now, they still use coal, and uh, they still have these problems there. Uh, but I think they recognize the competitive edge that's needed by moving away from fossil fuel and into alternative energies. India, on the other hand, is going to be like the United States as a democracy, where there are, there, that's politically problematic to move. Now, I'm not advocating that that we take on more of a government that looks like China. And obviously, India's got its own problems with, with corruption. But um, we're also talking about heavy um, number of people, large population, that um, lives um, without electricity, that lives without vehicles, without all the things that you mentioned. And they want it. And I've had a chance to, to um, walk around Delhi and see this uh, firsthand, and and I think India, which is going to pass China, uh, I think by 2028 is what they expect in terms of the largest country population-wise in the world. India is uh, the problem in the rear view mirror in terms of, of climate change emissions, and so you're exactly right. Uh, they need to be part of this discussion as well. <coughs> yes? Okay, uh, I read about, I think some of the European governments are, I don't know if these are laws or just perspective regulations talking about um, moving away from uh, the internal combustion engine. Um, do they, they are serious about this? That's pretty radical. Yeah, um, it is radical, but I mean, go back and uh, look at, at pictures of how people got around 100 years ago. Um, there were cars, not, not that many. Right? So go back, go back 120 years ago. And you think anybody 120 years ago anticipated our entire country being organized around an automobile. Um, so I, I do agree with you that how we think through these ideas that we have been hearing about, like driverless cars, cars without internal combustion engine, it sounds so high in the sky, you know, science fiction. Um, but I, I do think that we uh, will see here in the next decade plus very different transportation options. I know for a fact, um, your generation um, depends on where, on the density of, of the region you live in, right? So a place um, like Putnam County, we've got enough cars. But if you, if you go and you talk to people in um, cities your age, increasingly um, they're not getting the driver's license, that prize driver's license at age 16. They're, um, they're not thinking of the car as that traditional symbol of American freedom, right? So that you can go places without having to depend on your parents or other adults. Um, they're thinking of it more as the opposite, actually, as sort of a, as a ball and chain, if you will, right? That it's um, owning a car has lots of responsibilities, lots of financial responsibilities, right? You have to have insurance, maintenance, parking, and so particularly in, uh, in denser uh, urban environments, uh, people your age are thinking, 
I don't know, I'd kind of rather go out, <laughs> go get a nice meal, uh, see a movie, uh, do, do other stuff instead of have to, to, to pay on, on uh, put down continuous payments on this car. So I think that um, if you have other options, if you have public transit options, if you have, um, you know, the bus system in our country, in most places is not good, uh, but there are a few places where we can point to light rail. We were just talking about Portland uh, before. Uh, Portland has some amazing uh, transit op options. You know, the big cities that we hear about, you know, the Chicago's, the New York's, the Boston's, they have subway systems that are, uh, are very well utilized. But I, so I, sort of long way to get to your question, I do think that there will be significant changes. And we've been hearing about the driverless cars, obviously, We've got the Ubers and the Lyfts, um, uh, but a number of those are still using the internal combustion engine. It's these these um, shifts over the last um, 10 years to make cars like a Prius uh, affordable to more people um, and, and changing how we think about driving, uh, I think that's going to happen. Yes? Locations you mentioned, are there any local initiatives to mitigate this problem? Yeah, so uh, in, in all the cases there are, let me, get, let me give you an example because uh, it sticks with the sort of the economic issues that, that you were interested in, uh, Dr. Pat. Um, in, in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, um, what do you think of when you think of Australia? Kangaroos. Koala bears. Koala bears. So you think about some pretty unusual species, right? Species that don't exist anywhere else. Uh, well, other people think of that too. And Australia depends heavily on tourism. And in particular, the Great Barrier Reef does. And so when I was, was interviewing um, the, uh, the heads of the Chamber of Commerce in towns along the Great Barrier Reef, uh, time and time again, they had concerns about not only what is this doing to our ecosystems, but would people even want to come here as temperatures get warmer and warmer? We're going to have to have bigger boats with air conditioning. Um, and so economically, um, they're very much concerned. And they've, they've taken steps um, to um, try to, to minimize the parts of this that they can, which deals more with the agriculture that takes place and the, the, uh, the runoff from that. But in terms of, of um, impacts on uh, fossil fuel usage, no. In fact, you might point your finger at Australia because uh, that's where China gets its coal. I mean, China has its own coal too, but um, they've been getting significant amounts from Australia for years now. So they, they basically, you could argue, Australia has fueled China's China boom. And, um, and they, they, have, they, they struggle uh, with that, that coal dependence. I think we hear a lot about the problems of oil, and that oil is problematic. I mean, probably a day doesn't go by when each of us use some kind of oil product. Uh, but in your lifetime, we will reach a stage of peak oil where we've used about half of it up, and then oil will become increasingly more expensive and will be forced to turn to alternatives. That is not the case with coal. In the United States, we have about 282 years worth of supply of coal alone to run what we need. So if we want to move away from coal, we're going to have to do something besides just wait for the prices to go up. Yes? Considering how much yeah, so uh, excellent question. Um, what happens a lot with climate change is we get we get bombarded by um, some misleading information, and it gets it, some of it is is used for um, financial interest. Some of it has to do with uh, ide ideological concerns about what's next. If we, we start to talk about um, regulating 
uh, the causes of climate change? Are we opening up sort of a Pandora's box of all kinds of other regulations? So there's, there's a lot a lot going on here. Uh, let me say this. You're exactly right, climate changes. And uh, the problem I think sometimes people uh, have difficulty with is weather and climate are different, right? So we can have really cold days this year, but that doesn't mean that the planet's getting warmer. You have to look at at least 30 years worth of data, weather data, to even start to talk about climate. Now, um, that said, the chart I showed you at the beginning, that had about 100 years worth of data, I think it had like 130 years worth of data, that's still not very much, right? That's why I showed you the hockey stick graph, I showed you 1,000 years worth of data. What's cool about the ice core samples that's what they, where they go and they drill down into glaciers and they pull out, they cut them up in about, um, they cut them up in about uh, one meter and then they cut them for further into sort of a foot long slice and they, they, uh, they melt a piece of that ice out and then they measure inside there uh, what the distribution of gases is. And from that then they can extrapolate uh, a measurement of a concentration of CO2 in that air, and what they found, these ice core samples, they can go about, I think the, the furthest they've gone is down in Antarctica, about 700,000 years. And what they found that basically um, our CO2 concentration on this planet was set pretty stable at about 280 parts per million in the air until about 1900. Anybody know what we're at now? I had a slide in here before I had I took it out. Last week, um, the measurement was 410 parts per million carbon dioxide and molecule air. So there, there are um, volcanic eruptions. There are sunspots. There are a lot of things that can affect climate shifted. But nothing can explain what's happened over the last 100, 200 years in terms of that, except for what we use in fossil fuels. So it's the rate of increase that's alarming, particularly when I say that our number now is 410 parts per million. Um, there are some climate scientists that suggest a stable atmosphere requires a 350 parts per million. And if I were to show you this chart, I could try to um, call it up here um, if you want to stick around afterwards. But what it shows is, it's amazing how accurate it is, because it shows the seasonal variation taking place. It's literally showing the breathing of the planet uh, based on where most, where's most of the land mass on the, on the globe. The northern hemisphere, in particular the temperate um, um, land mass. And what does that vegetation do depending on winter or summer? With CO2. What we learned early on about plants and CO2, they soak it up, right? So what really, what, literally what you're seeing with this, this called the Mauna Loa Observatory out in, in Hawaii, you're seeing the northern hemisphere temperate plants, they're, the breathing, the ways in which in the um, summer, when that vegetation comes out, that 410 number is going to drop a little. So every year it looks kind of like me and my arthritic hand, if you chart it, every year it's going up, but it's also going up and down within the year. And so the data that we have on this is really um, precise. And it shows the fossil fuel usage, particularly the oil, the coal, the natural gas, are uh, what's driving us. Yes? Do you think steam power have something to do with climate change? Uh, so if you're... Uh, if you're using hydroelectric power, um, that has its own issues, but it's it's not um, creating um, a greenhouse gas. If it's steam power through you know coal, um, then yes. Yes. I, I like that question. 
question a lot. Yeah, I, um, I struggled with that for, for a number of years. I think um, that's a, a very good question for anyone that, that's passionate about this to, to think carefully through. Because what's, what's been happening um, over the last two decades is an increasing polarization in all kinds of issues in the United States, right? But climate change is one of them. And even as the science has gotten stronger and stronger, we know so much more than we did in the 1980s and 1990s about climate change. American public opinion about climate change, really until the last 18 months, has um, become more and more polarized. And that there is a change that's taking place, though. And it's really about the last 18 months, if you look at, at Gallup polls. Uh, that said, I think that there's still um, a, a significant divide in terms of what we should do about climate change and what, we, what, what kind of money we should put into trying to both mitigate and adapt. And I think you have to do both. A lot of times, People thought adaptation was a was a sellout, but I mean, what are you going to do with St. Augustine? What are you going to do with, with Miami Beach? I and mean, adaptation has to be part of the the um, plan right now. Uh, but more directly to your question, I, I would come at that a couple ways. The first first would um, I'd be very careful um, to not demean. Um, belittle, uh, make fun of, you know, in any way in their position, right? Even if it's not rooted in actual fact. Uh, that will just push them further away. Um, I think the, the best approach would be to find where there is common interest. Would you like to go to Bar Harbor and have an American lobster that was actually caught in U.S. waters? Um, would you like to go to South Beach and have a nice long weekend and not worry about uh, king tide um, ruining your car um, during the, uh, the morning um, tidal income? Right? Um, find common interests. Usually we can do that around future generations, right? Um, if it's your parents, perhaps you'll have kids someday and you can tap into their interest in their grandchildren. Right? Uh, but find common interest uh, and make it more about um, what do we do differently? There's a lot of different solutions from across the political spectrum, from conservative to liberal. Uh, but the lack of recognition that there is a problem, that has to be solved first. I had an interesting um, conversation on election day. I got a chance to interview a former congressman of, of South Carolina and talked to him for about, uh, I think it was about 75 minute conversation on the phone. And um, he uh, was a Republican from South Carolina, um, conservative district, um, and he had been very much against climate change. You've got to step to the sort of the talking points of the Heartland Institute out of Chicago, which, which really pushes um, climate change as this fallacy, a fantasy of the sort of the, the liberal client scientists out there. And um, a combination of his children and an invitation to go to Antarctica changed his mind. Um, he ended up losing his reelection bid. Um, but for the last 10 years, he's been, he's very much a dyed in the wool conservative. For the last 10 years, he's worked tirelessly to try to, um, to explain, I'm going to use the word educate, but sometimes that can, can be um, twisted, to explain the impacts of climate change to fellow conservatives. And what he kept beating back in, in, my, um, uh, in my head during that conversation was, as a conservative, I feel we are um, advocating the debate on what policy will be. So this is just going to be like the 1930s with the, with the New Deal. This is before we, had, we heard about the Green New Deal. Um, 
from the Congress, a uh, woman from New York. He said, we need to have a debate about what the policy solution should be across the political spectrum. And to continue to have the, the, the debate about whether or not there's even a problem is, is asinine. And so I think, I mean, if you think about it, you think about the environment, and you think about the term conservative, uh, that's where the most passionate advocates should be. Right? Conservatives want to keep things the way they are. You can look back politically, we have a tr proud tradition of conservative politicians from Teddy, Ro excuse me, from Teddy Roosevelt to in some ways even Richard Nixon. A lot of legislation happened under him. Um, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, um, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, but I like, I like Teddy Roosevelt just because it's, um, the, the name is, uh, it doesn't have the baggage that, that President Nixon's name has. Um, but uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, was instrumental in um, beginning our national park system. And he, uh, he was a very close friend of, of somebody from a different political spectrum, uh, the founder of the largest environmental group in the United States, the Sierra Club. Um, he was a good friend of John Muir's. And the legend is that actually in a camping trip, imagine that happening today. Um, John Muir took the president, the sitting president, on a camping trip in Yosemite National Park, and basically over, a, I think it was about a three-night affair, um, they, um, they hashed out a plan for what would become the National Park System, which has become the, the uh, envy of the world over, really. It's been copied in a number of other countries, this idea of the National Park System. Does that kind of answer your question? We can talk more if you want. Yes. Could uh, current magnetic pole fluctuations have any effect on climate change? I do not know. Um, I have not seen anything on that, but I can I can look into it. You can exchange emails. I've seen a I've seen a study where uh, they've been tracking the north and south pole magnetic pole. Yes, it is shifting. Yep, that's true. Um, yeah, let's talk some more after. Yes? Um, I'm an agriculture major, I'm learning animal science. I know we've had a lot of discussions lately about like how agriculture might be affecting climate change. Do you have any data or anything on that? Yeah, so it, it depends if you're looking at just the United States or if you're looking at global numbers. But we can break down um, how, what, what, what our daily activities, how they contribute. And agriculture production in um, the United States, I think, is under 20%, maybe closer to 15% of the explanation for the greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, the cow flatulence yeah. problem. Yeah, um, we've had discussions about that. But that, that pushes up much higher if you look at global numbers. So mm -hmm. you're looking at almost a quarter of emissions can be explained. Now, that's not all the cow problem. <laughs> it's also uh, the destruction of land. Mm -hmm and the land use changes. Um, but yeah, so we're anywhere from 10 to 25 percent, I would say, would be explained by that. Yes? here in the United States and there was even I think in the US high schools they did what, March 15th I believe was their walkout day unfortunately that happened on a lot of spring breaks so it didn't really show up I know that was the case for, for my kids um, but um, there's a, a, a lady that has been a, a, young, a young girl who's the leader of that and she's been very eloquent and um, and uh, in her interviews and has caught some people's attention. And you, you know, you do kind of see a generational um, tension here, right? So people like me, you know, uh, yeah, if I can make it through a couple stronger hurricanes, okay, but it's, it's not gonna affect me as much as it's gonna affect you. And 
so you have greater incentive <coughs> to push me and people of my generation to act now before it's too late for you. Like, you know, if you've got, you've got a paper due next week, why start today if you can start six days from now? It's the human nature to procrastinate. So you have to push me not to procrastinate. In, in our history, we've had a, a one world view, I guess, uh, toward the environment is that it's ours to, to, to use and to benefit from. And the same world view kind of uh, feels that technology is our solution. So this idea of procrastination, that it's okay to, to wait because we're going to invent some kind of technology that's going to uh, transition us into the next phase of the future and help us to overcome the problems. So, I guess the question is, uh, what what technologies are there that are helping us to bridge? And is there and not that technology is going to save us, obviously, uh, but how can we access technology and use technology to advance our solutions? So I think that back to the earlier question about changing in internal combustion engine. You know, the changes that we've seen in the last uh, twenty years. Um, the previous hundred, there weren't any, right? So um, technology certainly can be an asset. It's not a silver bullet, as you point out. Um, the, uh, well, let's see, I, I lost the uh, direction of thought here. You were, you were saying that this idea that we could do what we want and that technology will be there regardless, I think that we do have to revisit some old um, fears when it comes to technology. And the ones that climate scientists, he's now retired, but he was a famous climate scientist for, for years, and he's still an environmental activist uh, and a registered Republican. Uh, Jim Hansen uh, has suggested we have to rethink nuclear power. Uh, basically, uh, wind and solar are great options, and we've made remarkable progress there technologically. But if we really want that to be what we depend upon, uh, it's going to take another 20 years to get there. And the suggestion is we need bridge technologies to get us from fossil fuel to wind and solar. And the only two that make sense do have some problems. I think the one that has more problems, actually, is natural gas. And you can you know, go online and, and you can look at you know, Pennsylvania, Utah, um, Ohio, and, and uh, Colorado. You can see on YouTube uh, what can happen to people's water supply um, when um, natural gas, particularly fracking, um, goes wrong. Um, you can literally light the water on fire. Uh, they, uh, so natural gas um, has emerged, uh, going back to the Obama administration, uh, as a uh, game changer in how we think about moving away from coal and oil. But it has its own problems. The one that I would like to see more discussion about, and I think that there is uh, a lot more hope for, is, is nuclear power. Now that that's not without its own problems, uh, but they have new new power plants now. They call fourth generation power plants that greatly minimize the waste production, and um, and so uh, we only have 98 power plants in the United States ever since Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. It would have been a really twisted experiment about six miles from. Chocolate uh, plant uh, had its small core meltdown. There has been resistance to building any new nuclear power plants in the United States. And of course, uh, the Chernobyl disaster um, the next decade in what is Ukraine, uh, the Fukushima disaster during your lifetime, uh, they have helped reinforce fears about um, nuclear power. And it's true. 
accidents happen. There are safety concerns. Uh, but the other issue with nuclear power has been storage of the radioactive waste. And I think that these new power plants provide um, an opportunity to better deal with that problem. And then, of course, the other issue is consume less. Do we have time for any more questions? Or are we all done here? Oh, we're over already. <laughs> Thank you very much.